There are so many things you could meditate on. You could meditate on God's healing. You could meditate on God's provision. But if we meditate on our equality with God, that is the sharpening of the axe. Hi, this is Tim Grange and welcome to another episode of Phronesis. Today I want to answer one important question that I keep getting. People have always been asking me, why doesn't it work for me like I have seen it work for others? And what are we talking about? What do we mean by the it? You know, you read in scripture and you, you read about how, how God healed this person and God raised that person from the dead. You read about strange miracles and then you go outside of the Bible and you hear testimonies from people here and there talking about how God did this great move and, and God intervened in that area of their lives. And then you are wondering, so why am I struggling to have those experiences or talk less of being the vessel through whom God will do the same? I want to answer that. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10. This is the challenge that most believers are facing. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10. It says, if the iron be blunt and he does not wet the edge or sharpen the, when he says iron, he's talking about an axe and does not sharpen the axe, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. The scripture here is saying, he's using an analogy, saying there's a tree that needs to be cut down and somebody decides to take an ax to the tree and then he begins to really go at the tree. He's saying if the ax is blunt, it doesn't matter that he's using the right implement. It doesn't matter that he's even applying the right amount of pressure and energy. He says because the ax is blunt, he will require more energy than is necessary. As a matter of fact, he will wear himself out. So the question is not if you have the right acts, if you are praying in the name of Jesus, if you've learned how to use God's word, if you've learned all of that, then you are already bestowed with the right implement. The problem is, is your implement sharp? Now you'll say, but come on, what, what, what do you mean, Pastor Tim? I'm praying in the name of Jesus. I'm confessing God's word. What do you mean is my implement sharp? I will explain. You see, man is a tripartite being. He's a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. The day you got born again, your spirit became Christ. I don't have time to explain it, but your spirit did. Your spirit, 1 Corinthians 6 says that you are one spirit with God. Your spirit became Christ, and that was instantaneous. The challenge, though, is your soul which and your body, which exist in time, require time for them to be able to assimilate the same kind of revelation, quality of information, revelation, and life that your spirit already has. It takes time to cause your soul to now become as renewed as your spirit is. Your spirit received renewal instantaneously because your spirit does not exist in this dimension. Your spirit is born of God and God is spirit and in the realm of the spirit there is no time or space. So when your spirit Spirit was born again, it instantaneously became complete, it instantaneously became as God is. But your soul exists in time. And, and thank God you have a soul. Thank, thank God you have a body. It's the reason you exist in this dimension. But this dimension is governed by time. Because it's governed by time, it requires time to cause your soul to become as acquainted with truth as your spirit has become. And the process to get your soul to that place is through the art of meditation. You see, again, you could be saying the right words. You could be saying it in the name of Jesus. But if the ax is blunt, meaning you have not workshopped the truth into your subconscious, I know you know it here. But have you heard uh, people like Kenneth Hagen of, of, of blessed memory? He will talk about how you could know it in your head but you don't know it in your heart. Um, it was the great E.W. Kenyon that called that mental accent, meaning you agree with it mentally, but has it resonated with your subconscious or what we will call the heart? To get that same truth to your heart requires meditation. Let me, maybe this will help you. 
every day you are reminded of your mortality. Every day, every day you walk out into the sun and the sun hits your skin and burns it, you are reminded of your mortality. Every day you are driving in traffic, somebody upsets you and you feel that emotion rising in your, in, 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 within you, you are reminded of your mortality. Every day we are consistently reminded of our mortality, but not as much so about our immortality because the believer has an immortal life also resident on his inside. If the believer does not now take the time so that as much as he's being reminded of his mortality, he deliberately, consistently, on a daily, remind himself of his immortality and his immortal capacity. He will be hitting, saying the right words, making the right confession, saying it in the name of Jesus, but the acts will remain blunt. It takes your meditating to take the truth that you have come to see, to get it crystallized in your subconscious. It means if Jesus, because of the infilling of the Godhead, gives complete expression of everything that God is, meaning in character and in capacity, because you and I, the believer, are filled with the same fullness, you and I can also display God completely in character and in capacity. If this is the case, it then behooves us to spend time daily making this confession into, till we have workshopped this truth into our consciousness. You'll say, but, but I've read the scripture before, Pastor Tim, and I know, I know that that's what the scripture is saying. No, I doubt that we really do. Jesus was standing in front of a fig tree. He cursed the fig tree. When he cursed the fig tree, did you notice nothing happened? Nothing happened, at least to the naked eye. It was when they left, came back the next day, that they saw that the fig tree had died. Do you know, if it was you and I, probably, we would have cursed the fig tree, noticed that nothing is happening, and then we would have cursed it a second time, cursed it a third time, probably gone to have lunch, come back, look at it, say it's not working, cursed it a, a fourth time, not realizing that the second time we made that declaration was out of doubt and unbelief. And, and, and this, see, Jesus knew that even though nothing looked like it was happening, there was no need to say it a second time. He knew that because he gives full expression of the Godhead and God's word cannot return to, he says he watches over his word. God's word cannot return to him void. He knew that even though nothing seemed to have been happening to the naked eye, something had been generally and most definitely occurred. They came back and it was dead. Are we certain that we believe this, this truth in our heart? And I'm sharing with you the confession, the, the, the meditation that you need to workshop. There are so many things you can meditate on. You can meditate on God's healing. You can meditate on, on the God's provision. But if we meditate on our equality with God, that is the sharpening of the ax. The day something in you clicks and you suddenly awaken to the reality that you and the Father, by virtue of the sacrifice of Jesus, are one. You will say the same things you've been saying before in the same name of Jesus and notice that your results are totally different. It says here that you too are filled. Somebody say it with me. I am filled with all of God. Come on, say it with me. I am filled with all of God. This means as God speaks and cannot be denied, neither can you. Make time this week, make time daily this week to workshop this into your consciousness. When I catch you next time, we will push this thought even further. This has been Tim Grage. Senior Pastor of the City of Zion, Santa, on Finesses. Bye for now. You may be troubled by the circumstance in the world, but I have good news for you. The kingdom of God is here. I am Honfio Seni, and I'm so honored to be on this wonderful broadcast. And I'll be teaching on living in the power of the kingdom. You know, Jesus Christ 
was visited at night by Nicodemus. And I'd just like to read from the Bible that particular discourse. John chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now Jesus Christ gave an interesting response and we need to catch it because the truth, the revelation of the kingdom will change your life forever. Don't miss this series because I tell you the trajectory of your life will only go upwards when you catch this truth. And look at Jesus' reply. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, very I say unto thee, Except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus Christ was responding to the statement that Nicodemus made about miracles. Hallelujah. So why is he, what's the link between the kingdom of God and the miracles of Jesus? Now, what Jesus was saying was this. You're seeing miracles in my life, but this has to do with the kingdom. Now, the reason why many theologians have not caught this truth is because of a misunderstanding of the term kingdom. Most of the time, they think the word kingdom and kingdom of heaven are interchangeable, hallelujah, or mean the same thing. Only a few cases. They do not mean the same. The word kingdom of heaven is talking of a location, talking of the rulership of God in heaven. While the kingdom of God talks of authority, power, and dominion. The word kingdom of God, if you check it in um, a very good lexicon or Greek dictionary, because the Bible was originally written in Greek, it talks of number one, power, authority, and rulership. And secondary, it could talk of where a king rules. Hallelujah. And also the usage of kingdom of God in the Bible does not really talk of a location. Because when John the Baptist came, the Bible says he came preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand or it's about to appear or it's about to come into manifestation. And Jesus Christ came preaching the kingdom. Hallelujah. And Jesus also said in the book of Matthew that when a demon is cast out of a person that the kingdom of God has come to that person. What does that mean? So he's not saying the location of God has come or heaven has come. He's saying the power and authority of God has come to the person. So this is so important because he's relating that a man, Jesus is saying clearly that you can't see the kingdom of God unless you are born from above. Now, looking at the word kingdom of God, you see that until John the Baptist, the kingdom of God had not manifested on the earth. When Adam fell, he lost that dominion. He lost that authority. He lost kingdom authority. And until Jesus came on the scene, nobody had walked in or experienced the kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus Christ said that the John the Baptist, Jesus said John the Baptist is the greatest of all men, of all prophets, and the greatest of men born of women. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Now, what is Jesus talking about? He's saying that unless a man is born from above, he has no access to the kingdom. So, whether it be Moses, Daniel, Elijah, Isaiah, Joseph, David, Solomon, they all did great things. We saw great miracles in their lives, but none of them walked in the kingdom. None of them walked in God's power as Jesus brought it. Hallelujah. So Jesus was saying, you see these miracles to Nicodemus, and you are amazed at it. I'm not talking of the power that God manifested through Moses or Elijah. I'm talking of the kingdom of power that is at another level. A power or, 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 or dominion that is beyond what anybody in the Old Testament experienced. Only a man that is born again, or literal in the Greek, only a man that is born from above, can understand, see, and enter into God's authority. So there's a realm of authority that Jesus walked in, and there's a realm of authority that Jesus brought to the world for the church to walk in that no one in the Old Testament ever tasted. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? This means that, child of God, you are beyond Moses. You are beyond Elijah. You are beyond Elisha. You can walk in wisdom like none of them did. You can walk in more wisdom than Solomon ever imagined. That's why Paul says in the book of Corinthians that I had not seen, 
nor ear heard, neither had it come into the heart of man that which God has prepared for them that love him. So unless you are born, or, born from above, that's why there is no comparison. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that the glory that Moses had, the glory, the manifestation, the miracles, the power that Moses operated, he said when you compare to the, the church, to the ministration of righteousness, it is absolutely nothing. So, beloved of God, the problem is not lack of power. Many Christians, oh God, give me power. Oh, Father, just give me more grace. Oh God, God, give me more wisdom. No, the moment you are born again, you are born into that power. The moment you are born again, you have the kingdom in you. You have God's authority and God's wisdom on your inside. So, the reason why you may be weak, you may be oppressed and defeated, is not because you lack the ability to overcome those obstacles, it's because you don't know it or you don't know how to apply it. If you will take advantage of the kingdom you are in, of the authority that you have in Christ, I'll tell you no opposition, no devil, no witch can stand against you. You, you should never say I'm confused. When you say a believer saying he's confused, it shows that he, he lacks the knowledge of who he is in Christ. When you know who you are and what you have because of Jesus, you know, like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, that Christ is made unto me wisdom. And you know, the devil will always tell you lies. Any thought of doubt, any thought that doesn't edify you, any thought that says you're not going to make it, your business will not make it, is sent by the devil to steal your victory. You know, Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ talked about the kingdom? He said, the kingdom of God is like a man who sows seed. And some fell, fall on the wayside, some fall on, you know, the rocky ground, uh, and some fell among thorns. But you know what he said about the first case? When the word of the kingdom is preached, the devil comes, at, and when it's not understood, he steals it away. That's why if you think kingdom of God is location, the devil has already stolen your authority. The devil has already put in a position where you will be oppressed and defeated. But when you understand that the kingdom of God talks of God's authority and power that you have because of Jesus, because you are seated in heavenly places, then the devil can steal it and then you can put him to run. Then you can speak to your business and begin to prosper. Because the devil is attacking the business of Christians. He's telling you you'll never make it. He's robbing us of our prosperity. But child of God, it's time to take what belongs to you and walk in abundance health and victory as never before. God bless you and keep the switch of faith turned on. It's been very difficult to accept the fact that you know more with us. But we are comforted with the truths that Paul communicated to the church in Corinth that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. We want to thank God for the opportunity to have known you personally and for the honor of your friendship. You've left the baton for us to pick up from where you left off to push kingdom agenda just the way you tirelessly and passionately went about it. On behalf of 1 John 5, 4, Frunesis Africa, and my house, we want to send our condolences to your wife, your children, our daddy and our mommy, daddy and mommy Jill, and to the rest of the Adeboye's family. And to the ROCCG nation, I pray the Lord will comfort us. Good night, my brother. Sleep on until we meet to part no more in the bosom of the Master. Shalom. Welcome to Phronesis. Once again, my name is Pastor Ezekiel Latang, and I'm taking you on the relationship segment of this broadcast. Today we are talking about choice making blunders. Choice making blunders. You agree with me that a marriage is as successful as the rightness of the choice of partner. Once your marriage has, once you have a wrong partner, you're going to have a very uphill task trying to have a good marriage or a peaceful marriage. You don't blunder when it comes to choice making. 
When it comes to marriage, it cannot be another person's choice. It has to be your choice. You should be able to look back afterwards and see that you made a right and informed choice for yourself in marriage. So choice making, for instance, is a sign of maturity. It's a sign that you are ready to move on, you're ready to get married, and so on. So you cannot claim to be mature in marriage if someone else is going to make the choice for you. You have to be able to make the choice for yourself. If you can't make the choice, then don't marry. Delay or postpone, delay your marriage. If someone else has to make that choice for you, then you shouldn't go in, at least not now. Know also that your choice will either bring you life or death. Deuteronomy 13, 19 says that, you know, he said, I place before you life and death. So, in, as you make choices for marriage, you're either going to choose life or you're going to choose death. You can't choose both ways. Very, very important. It will either bring you cursing or blessing. The person you choose to be your spouse will either be a curse to you or a blessing to you. So, you must be careful in your choice-making uh, move. It will either take you down or take you backward, take you up or take you down, front or backward and so on. So your choice must be thought-based. Your choice must not be feeling-based. You should play the feelings down to the background, to the barest minimum, and focus on thought. Let your choice be thoughtful. Okay, we saw in uh, Numbers 36 verse 6, this is what the Lord says to the daughters of Zelophehad, let them marry to whom they think best. So you must put thought to it, you must think about it, you must consider, you must think well. Let them marry to whom they think best. So there are blunders you must seriously avoid on your journey to marriage. Number one choice making blunder is hasty choice making. Haste, haste, haste. People run into haste with choice making for various reasons. Whatever makes you rush or hurry into a decision will cause you problems somewhere in the future. Whatever makes you rush into making a haste in choice making will give you problems somewhere in the future. So don't let yourself or anyone make you rush or run in a hurry to propose or to accept proposal from anybody just like that. You must take good time to think and pray about the choice you want to make. Think and pray. You cannot rush. When you rush, the Bible says you will not be innocent. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 20 says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. You will definitely make blunders when you rush. Anything done in a haste will give you problems. Note, it doesn't mean that if someone proposes to you, you should take forever to give them the answer. Uh, you know, all in the name of, of you don't want to be in a hurry. No. You, within a week or two or so, you should be able to know whether someone is the one you want to marry or not. So, get that. Number, no, the, number two, uh, choice-making blunder is choice making without counsel choice making without counsel the bible says in proverbs eleven fourteen, where there are no there is no counsel where there is no counsel people will fall where there is no counsel purposes are disappointed you as a person you're looking at one side of things life has positioned you in a particular place to see things from one end the other people who are planted at other ends will need to give you their report and give you their feedback so you can make informed choice and informed decision. Counsel helps you to see things from other people's point of view. The other people who are not under pressure, the other people who are not pressurized to do anything. It helps you see things from their point of view. Praise God. And there is counsel also with wrong people so you want to avoid wrong people in when you're looking for counsel avoid people who are not suitable who are not in the right place to give you counsel praise god there is always that person that loves you genuinely that will be that is not afraid to tell you the truth that will be able to tell you exactly what it is you need to hear praise god number three choice making blunder is making decisions under pressure 
making decisions under pressure. And there are many kinds of pressure. All these pressures have different root causes. Many kinds of pressure. For instance, there's the pressure from seeing your mates get married. The pressure of seeing your mates get married can get to you and, and you just, anybody that comes along, you just want to go ahead and marry them. God's plan for your life is not the same as that of the other person. Even if you guys were born on the same day, God's plan for your life is different from that of any other person. So you don't want to allow yourself to come under the pressure. The road you will travel will not be the same road the other person will travel. Both of you have your destinies to fulfill and your timings are different. All right? It is pressures that come from comparing yourself with other people and it's not a wise thing to do. So don't do that. Hallelujah. There are other kinds of pressure we're going to talk about, but we're going to talk about them next week. Praise God. So what are the choice-making blunder? We said uh, choice-making without counsel and choice-making in a haste, hasty choice-making, and then uh, uh, choice-making under pressure. So we have just dealt with one, one angle of the pressure. We're going to be dealing with maybe three other angles of pressure uh, by next week. It's very important that you note this, that choice making must be well done. It's give yourself the gift of a lifetime of a good person, a good partner, someone you love, someone you trust, someone who pleases God, someone who loves God, and obviously is going to love you too. God bless you till I come your way again the same station next week. Have a great time. Amen. Bye-bye. Let me tell you something. It's not a coincidence that you've just tuned in and you found me. I want to tell you something. You may never have another opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus. If you were to die right now, are you assured of an eternity in heaven? Well, if you're not, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Perhaps you're even a Christian and you've backslidden it. Some of your ways are no longer in line with the things that God has in store for you. Or perhaps you've never received Jesus. Either way, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. If you feel Jesus knocking at your heart, I want you to say with me, say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again for my sins. I receive you as the Lord of my life and my Savior. Holy Spirit, I welcome you into my life. If you've said that prayer, then you have just become part of God's big plan, God's big agenda. I want you to ask for my free ebook called New Beginnings. And if you have done that, I also want you to join a good Bible-based church and begin to grow in your walk with God. God bless you.